Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 257 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. I'm Seth, probably better known as Saffron Olive, and we have the full crew here this week kicking things off with the owner of MTG Goldfish, Richard. How's it going today, Richard? Hey, Seth. How's it going? Uh, Going well. Excited. We have a ton of new cards to talk about. It's officially Theros Beyond Death preview season, so uh, that's going to be a big focus of our cast. But before that, we have another co-host in Krim. What's up this week, Krim? Morning, Seth. Uh, You know, just pretty excited. We've got a bunch of things to talk about today (laughs) yeah so our main plan for today last week we mentioned doing kind of like a two-part look back at 2019 we might still get to a little bit of 2019 stuff although really we covered a lot of it last week so main focus for today new theros beyond death cards spoiler season is here we have a ton of cards a bunch of sweet cards mythics and rares and gods so that's going to be our main focus maybe a little bit more of 2019 wrap-up stuff after that and then of course answering your fish mail so hopefully everyone is having a wonderful holiday season hopefully everyone's ready for some spoiler talk and uh yeah let's jump into it richard theros beyond death guide us through some sweet 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 new cards all right preview season starts off officially today although last week over the holidays we got one card every day so uh we are going to talk about all of them so clothos clothos god of destiny <laughs> i should i should like read up on like greek pronunciation i'm sure there's like a very clear way to pronounce this if you knew like how <laughs> greek words are supposed to be pronounced god of destiny I do one not. red green so three cmc four five legendary enchantment creature god indestructible as long as your devotion to red and green is less than seven Clothus isn't a creature at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase exile target card from a graveyard if it was a land, add red or green. Otherwise, you gain two life, and Clothus deals two damage to each opponent. I mean, this feels like a really strong card to me. The first thing I thought of when I saw this is it's basically Deathrite Shaman God. Like, you don't have quite as much <laughs> control over it, but the abilities are like exactly Deathrite Shaman in gruel form on a god body, and you get a 4 5 indestructible if you can get your devotion up. I think this card is going to be pretty strong, especially with escape and like the graveyard, some theme of Theros. Uh, I don't know what the the downside of this is. It just feels kind of good all around. You gain life against aggro. You drain your control opponent with this hard to deal with threat. And you might even get to ramp into like a Nissa or something. It just feels strong to me. And the fact that it's three mana is, is just, the, like, that's the sweet spot, right? I mean, like, it, cause I mean, if it, like there's cards that can just like, you know, like, like Teferi can still bounce your god, stuff like that. So it's nice to know that you could just, like, play your three drop. And then, like, I I do actually think this... <laughs> it's weird, a, a little weird that Grawl has this ability. It just doesn't seem very Grawl-like or Gruel or whatever. Like, it, it's kind of a weird effect for Grawl to have. And I, I'm just like, oh, all right, well, sure, whatever. I mean... <laughs> I, I I don't mind seeing green get more more stuff like at, outside of their color wheel, but like it's just interesting to see it. I mean, the red part is the deal two damage, and the green part right. is exile land, add ramp, gain two life. Uh, but yeah. like Seth said, I think this is Deathrite Sh- Shaman Siege. Like it reminds <laughs> me of the the sieges from Khan's Dragon. I don't know what it is. But it's like a three-man enchantment that does something every turn. And in this case, it ramps or it drains and uh, keeps you alive while killing your opponent. Seven devotion is a ton. I doubt you would ever turn this on. If you've turned this on, you've probably won already. Uh, but- I mean, it does, it does add to itself, too. So it's kind of like five devotion plus the god itself, which yeah. helps a little bit. But-, uh, but five mana symbols in addition. But I don't think it's relevant. <laughs> I, I really think this is just a siege where it's like a three mana ramp you every turn or deal damage. And I think it's going to be pretty good. I think we'll see someplace, somewhere. Uh, like the four life, uh, life total swing is pretty relevant. Every, it's like almost like a Nissa. And like you can't really deal with this. It's indestructible. You need to exile it. Uh, and it's just sitting there annoying you until you die. Yeah, I feel like when I first saw it, I was a little skeptical of the ramp ability. But since we've seen Clothis, we've seen like a few different cards that kind of like stock your graveyard, like the Binding of the Titans, for example. So maybe it actually will ramp a little bit in standard. I was thinking like, this seems like a card I'd be very hyped to play in Commander. Not as my Commander. I think it's kind of like meh as a Commander. But in your 99, 
Graveyard Hate's good. It's going to consistently ramp, especially if you're like a fairly high-powered playgroup with fetch lands, where you're always going to have a land to exile. And, like, the life gain and whatnot is fine, but just as, like, a three-mana ramp card that'll eventually be a big indestructible blocker, it feels like I would play this in a lot of Gruul Commander decks, I think. All right. Well, speaking of filling your graveyard in green, we have the Binding of the Titans. One in a green. It's an uncommon enchantment saga. Verse one. Each player puts the top three cards of the library into their graveyard. Part two is exile up to two target cards from graveyards. For each creature card exiled this way, you gain one life. Part three, return target creature or land from your graveyard to your hand. Mono green mill. <laughs> uh, do you remember, what was the card from uh, Shadows of Rhaenystrad standard? It saw like a lot of play. It was a two minute instant. You mill three and get back a lander creature. It was like a delirium enabler. Grapple, grapple with grapple the pass, with the maybe? Pass. Yeah. yeah. This is basically a slow grapple with the pass that gives you a way to maybe like hate on your opponent's escape card in between with the like Kaya uptick second lore counter. I think it's actually pretty good. Uh, we haven't seen a ton of escape cards yet apart from Elspeth and like one random common. But if escape is a thing, I think there's a lot of value in just like dumping cards in your graveyard, which would probably make Binding of the Titans actually pretty playable in a deck like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, not not excited. What? About, okay, okay. It's so it, slow. Take, like take it is two. technically grapple, except you have to wait like two turns to get it. Yeah, at sorcery speed, right? Like that's the problem. If you peel the grapple like on turn five, you're good to go. But this is like drawing ancestral vision on turn five. Like not what you want <laughs> it, to be doing. <laughs> it's grapple with really suspend, right? <laughs> yeah. What like, what about what about like delirium and pioneer? It gives you an enchantment in your graveyard, plus the cards that you mill. I, I would just play grapple. Just... I, I would just actually play grapple. <laughs> so, so bad grapple is where, yeah, where you're like, coming down on this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, depends, I, I, it depends how much you need the graveyard. So, like Maybe like there's a really strong graveyard deck, and you're willing to play this mediocre card to, to power that. But I think in a vacuum, I think this was really slow. Yeah, I just don't see this as a, a like, at least currently, until the whole set is revealed. I mean, right now, I, I don't see much use for this. It's a little too slow. I'm higher on it than you guys are. I, I think it's, I think it's okay. I don't think it's, like, great or broken, but I think it's, I would put it as playable if you're a deck that values filling your graveyard. But suspend two sets. Suspend two. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, how about Allure of the Unknown? Speaking of controversial <laughs> cards, three black, red, so five CMC sorcery. Reveal the top six cards of your library. An opponent exiles a non-land from among them. Then you may put the rest in your hand. That opponent may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. You can say this... it, Grim. Say say that it works well with Teferi. No, this, this is amazing. This <laughs> this is like so, like looks so much fun. Uh, I, I I don't know how good <laughs> this will be. Like not at least not yet. But I mean, in EDH, this seems like a blast. Like <laughs> you could easily play some stuff. Uh, like like getting to draw five or whatever, and then <laughs> doing this in EDH is like perfect. In standard. I have no clue. I, I I'm a little concerned that the opponent can ob they're gonna obviously get the best card and X and like just play it for free, right? So that's gonna be abysmal at times. <laughs> yeah, it, it's I like it for commander too. I like the political aspects. You can maybe like if you trust your opponents enough, be like, hey, if I target you with this, will you like take the wrath that we all need or something? So maybe uh, it could be good there. I think it's fun in commander either way. In standard pretty skeptical it kind of like forces you to play a lot of bad cards because you'll be afraid that if you play good <laughs> cards your opponent gets them for free so i guess if you want to build like bad card dot deck this is a great draw spell but if you play good cards it goes down in value a little bit i think yeah so you I would never play cards. this in a control deck unless you're combo you know you're comboing with teferi or lavinia like if you play a mid-range deck or anything this is terrible right because your opponent gets the best card and the best card is probably pretty good uh and they basically get like what, like 10 mana of tempo or something? Because you spent like five <laughs> mana to cast this and they get a free spell off of it, right? Uh, but if you're playing like a Rakdos aggro deck, this could be decent. Like if you draw like three burn spells, your opponent gets a burn spell, burns your face, no one cares, or they cast a Rimrock Knight, like whatever. 
get an ember cleave, like whatever, right? Like it doesn't matter. And the cards in your hand are more valuable. Uh, so I could see it working in a deck like that. Now, would you rather just play Frenzy or something? I don't know. Is five too much? Maybe. But I think it has to be an aggro card where your opponent gets a burn spell, removes one of your attackers, but you have a grip full of new cards. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah. I think I think that's true. Maybe like sideboard fragger decks. I saw some people saying like, "Oh, this would be awesome with fires." It's like, eh, don't you want to like <laughs> have good cards in your fires deck to cast? Can you really like cast this? And your opponent's like, "Okay, I'll take casualties of war, blow up your fires and your land and your and your cavalier and your planeswalker." Go. It's good against fires, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they can't cast yeah. the spell, <laughs> right? That's that's true. That is actually good against fires. I could see sideboarding in like Rakdos Knights or something. Like you said, I don't know if it's better than Frenzy or the other options, but that's the kind of deck that could take advantage of it. Like, right. I, I don't even think it's like, yeah, it, you would definitely play it only against like a control deck or something, right? Because like, like Richard said, like, cool, I will cast your, I don't know, <laughs> some 1-1. One, one. All right, cool. There you go. <laughs> now And then you get five cards. I, I wish it was a must. And then like you somehow like rip like four phages or something. Yeah. And, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, next up, we have Timurit Calls the Dead. It's a rare <laughs> enchantment saga, two in a black. Step one and step two, put the top three cards of your library into your graveyard. You may exile a creature or enchantment from your graveyard. If you do, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Step three, you gain X life and scry X, where X is the number of zombies you control. <laughs> I just like this name. I, I I mean, like, I think the card is like decent, but like, it's just a funny name. I, I'm I'm really sad they don't just have him like on a payphone or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, zombies. <laughs> Hello, zombies. It is I, Merit. <laughs> uh, I actually think this card, like. It, to me, when I read this, and maybe I'm looking at it in too positive of a light, but it reads a lot like History of Benalia to me. You play it, you get a 2-2. You play uh next turn, you get a 2-2. The third lore counter, that's where it gets a little sketchy, I guess. Like, gaining a bit of life and scrying, not as powerful as, like, pumping your team and killing your opponent, I guess. Uh But I still think that card is, like, close to being decent like two two I, twos for three mana and filling your graveyard with your escape stuff or whatever reanimation targets it doesn't seem that bad to me i i would play this in esper stacks Ooh, like that's like a- that's that's the first thing i mean like yeah there's a lot of artifacts but like maybe you go a little more in the enchantment route i don't know something like that or try to do something like that yeah, and I, then you I, can I, sack it before the third lore counter, so you don't have yeah. to deal with the lackluster one. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Because I mean, oh my gosh, that that third option is so. Uh, yeah, like, like if, I, you, I, if you need I, zombie tokens and if you need to mill yourself, then maybe this is passable. But other than that, I don't think you play this right. Like history of Analia, you can just jam in any deck, and you get yeah. two twos. They have vigilance, plus you get a massive pump to attack. This one, the third one, doesn't even count as an ability. Like, if it was, yeah. like, draw They should have just given us the mill ability again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That actually would have been better. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, three mana for two, 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 two twos. Four, four. Like, for three mana, I can get a five, five nowadays. Like, I, I, I don't know. It doesn't seem that good unless you need the zombie synergy or the milling, which uh, we probably will need somewhere. And I think Esper Stacks is a good spot for it. There's not really a reason to play zombies in standard at this point. I was like actually researching that a little bit, and there's like not really any tribal synergies for the most part. So, eh, I guess that's a another mark against it. Enchantment synergies? I don't know. It, it's just the the gain X life and scry X is like terrible. It could have been anything. It could have been like deal X. It could have been draw X. <laughs> could have been make another zombie you just go back yeah i don't i don't want the upgrade give me the last verse <laughs> or or like even better just like cut the scry i mean like would it have been too crazy to have a drain yeah. like like you gain the life and they lose x like i that would have been cool yeah yep. all right next up we have storm's fury two red red it's a sorcery deals four damage to each creature and each planeswalker it cracks me up to this card like 
doesn't kill any planeswalkers. <laughs> like so many of the planeswalkers in standard are like five or six loyalty. So uh so yeah, I mean I don't think it's bad. I don't know. I was looking at the best decks in standard currently, and obviously this could change with uh Theros, maybe we get a new meta, but it seems like it's kinda like I don't know, maybe 30% of the matchups, this is a card I'd want in my main deck. Like, if you play against Rakdos Knights or, like, any Innkeeper deck, it's probably good. But against Jun Food, it's kind of, like, okay. Against Fires, it's bad. Against Flash, it gets countered. Against Ramp, you don't kill anything. Like, I don't know. This feels more like a sideboard card to me than something that's going to be a main deckable sweeper. Ew, ugh. Wish it exiled. <laughs> uh, that's the only thing for me. I, I wish it exiled. It doesn't, it doesn't look great yet uh, but it is nice that there's something that also hits planeswalkers and creatures uh for a lot cheaper yeah if you can like yeah. copy it with thousand year storm then it would be good. Uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i feel like once we, we get into the territory we <laughs> we like gotta cast this expansion explosion then you actually have a good card <laughs> <laughs> uh tobler uh like what is it torbrand tobler yeah <laughs> and then we can maybe kill planeswalkers <laughs> Th- this would have been good like a year ago before we got insanely buff creatures and planeswalkers like nowadays if you cast this on curve you might not even kill the three drop in um love struck beast and, or you know, Lorvo or any of those. <laughs> Yorvo. I don't remember the name. Our planeswalkers that go to six loyalty. And oh, like good thing Oko is not here because this definitely won't kill Oko. But yeah. I, I don't know. Like maybe it picks off more of the spark uh, planeswalkers. Mm, I don't know. I think I think it'll be played. But I don't think it's like, oh my god, four mana sweeper. It's just like conditional sweeper that you might play depending on the metagame and what yeah, you I- think. That's that's probably about right. What do you think about this in Fires decks? That was, like, my first thought. Like, oh, you can play Fires. This is four mana. You wrath the board. Or does Deafening Clarion, thanks to, <laughs> thanks to like, the weird life gain mode of all things, actually beat out Storm's Fury in Fires decks because the lifelink is so important? I'll take the lifelink. <laughs> like, this kills, what, Questing Beast? That Clarion does it? Like, what other four toughness creatures are there that... <sighs> that matter? Yeah. Not, uh... not a... Not a ton that I can think Girl of. Girl Spellbreaker. Let's see. If it, it doesn't matter if they decide they want to riot it or not. It all it dies all the same. There we go. I'll take the life link. Yeah, I guess Ceratops. <laughs> you get rid of Shifting Ceratops. I, that's, a, that's a little something. Would this this would be pretty bonkers if it were three mana, right? Yeah, it'd be very strong at three mana, I think. <laughs> but I feel like with the power level of where things are, you know what I mean? Like... I think this could have just been three mana. <laughs> Krim just wants no one to play creatures. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> well, also, it, it hurts It kills planeswalkers. your planeswalker. Yeah. Yeah, like, I, I genuinely think with how powerful, like, the cards have gotten in Magic, like, this on three mana just, like, fits right in. It'd be too good. Like, the problem is, the problem with, like, good Wraths is you can't play around them. Right, it's like if you put one creature on the battlefield, they kill it. If you put two, now they have a three mana wrath for some reason. Like, <laughs> still not a, a like a clean board wipe though. I, I mean, like it gives us more like in cheaper and efficient ways to like you know deal with planeswalkers. If if you're looking for that, I, I don't know. I think. Like, if it was three mana, wouldn't this just immediately be, like, a staple back to modern? Because all the, like, Anger oh, yeah. of the Gods and Sweltering oh, yeah. Suns only deal three. So this would be, like, yeah. immediately playable all the way back to modern, I'm, I think, if it was I three. mean, like, it's no different than, I don't know, anything coming out of, I guess, Modern Horizons, I guess. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, almost everything from that's, like, a staple. I mean, Elko was immediately playable in, like, every yeah. format. So that's fine. what I mean. Like, like, yes, it would be very good. I would not doubt that. But, I mean, just with the power level of Magic cards, this almost feels like it's just natural that we would have a three mana deal four to everything all right next up we have woe strider two in the black three cmc it's a three two horror when woe strider enters the battlefield create a zero one white goat creature token sacrifice another creature scry run scry one escape two black black xl four other creature or four other cards from your graveyard woe strider escapes with two plus one plus one counters on it this card so, is It's a three so mana good. three two, makes a zero one, is a sack outlet, and then when you escape for five and four other cards, it comes back as a five four. Yeah. 
This card, it's really good. I think this card, I'm, I was like surprised when I saw this C print. Like aristocrat strategies, thanks to like cat and witches oven are already top tier in the format, already arguably the best, the best deck in the format. And they don't have a free sacrifice outlet. Like we haven't had a free repeatable sacrifice outlet in standard for a long time. And this is a really good one. You get the, uh, Veraska or Vasira Seer ability where you get to like scry as you sacrifice. I think this card is really, really good and is going to cement aristocrats, like, whatever cat food decks at the top of the meta. Yeah, I think this card is pretty absurd. Like, <laughs> three mana and you also just get a zero one on top of that just to, like, throw away. Like, and, and the fact that you can keep doing this, I think that I'm a-okay with that. And it comes back even better. Yeah, I, I don't even think it needed the escape part of it. It would still be played. <laughs> but for some reason... It's like immortal and comes back as like a 5 4. So I, I don't know what they were thinking with this. It seems really good. Um, I've yeah. been. Get I've ready been, for more cats. <laughs> more cats, more ovens. And I actually think this is uh, a card that's exciting for Pioneer. Rally decks haven't really found their footing in Pioneer, partly because the sack outlets are kind of meh ish. This is a sack outlet that you can like mill over to your whatever Seder Wayfinders or Stitcher suppliers and get it back from the graveyard and do the like sack your board in desperation to try to find rally trick to win the game. So I think that this is going to see play at least back to Pioneer too. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have Nylea Sharp Eyed. Unofficial translation. We don't know what her name is. <laughs> Three and a green, five, six, legendary. Creature enchantment god, indestructible. As long as your devotion to green is less than five, Nylea is not a creature. Creature spells you cast cost one less. Two and a green, reveal the top card of your library. If it is a creature card, add it to your hand. Otherwise, you may put it in your graveyard. This is amazing. <laughs> I think this card's amazing. <laughs> like, it, it reduces all your creatures by one. And on top of that, it can get you more creatures. Like, uh, and, throw, and, and then throwing away cards isn't exactly the worst thing either. So I, I am, I am on board with this card. I'm actually like kind of man this card. I, I like it's a mythic. It's powerful. Five six indestructible for four. It's fine. But I actually don't think it's like that exciting for me. When I read it, I think like okay, I'm playing a green deck. I've probably already like mostly emptied my hand by the time I play my four drop, and then I can pay three, and I have like a maybe 50-50 chance of drawing a card. So if I pay six, I'll probably draw a card. That doesn't seem that efficient to me. So I don't know. Like, maybe it's better <laughs> than I'm giving it credit for, but this one didn't really jump off the page to me as, uh, as being super busted or anything. I, I mean, I don't think this is, like, going to get banned or anything like that. But, like, <laughs> uh, I do I do think that the, the ability, not, like, tapping or anything like that, just, like, a mana sink for you when you, like, we all know green can make a ton of mana. And on top of that... Uh, like just, yeah, like you can throw the card away, right? The thing that's on top. So you can eventually find a creature. I think that's pretty sweet. Uh, obviously, like as much mana as you have will allow you to do whatever. But the, the, the fact that you just now have a late game ability that you could just use immediately if this resolves. Um, and, and like, yeah, you could just start digging. And I think that's pretty cool. And it, and yeah, like the reduction will matter because, you know, like, if we're using our mana to go dig for stuff, you know, maybe we find something and uh, we can actually cast it immediately. Yeah, I think this is, like, a sideboard card for grindy matchups. Like, this is the nuts if you have, like, a Nissa or something and you're like, yes, I will, like, dig, like, three or four deep. So I think in those cases, uh, Natalie is a good sideboard card. But four mana is a lot, and there's a lot of good cards competing with it. So I don't know if you could play this generically. And if you're not playing a Nissa deck... I, I don't I don't know. Like three mana is a lot. Like Dustwatch Recruiter comes to mind. Yeah. Uh, people played that. Uh but it was also like an aggressive creature. So not and sure. And it also dug three deep to to hit a creature. So you were yeah. like almost certainly gonna hit draw a card for three mana. And with this you're like, yeah, maybe sometimes. Yeah, but this one can actually be a decent creature. Like devotion to five is not terrible. Like you can actually turn that on. Your vote into this with anything makes it a creature. Like that's that's a little bit frightening. Yeah, yeah like, your vote. 
at the same Ma- time, Mana like, Dork oh, into like your vote into this is like okay. Oh, there's so many four drops though. That's I think my other concern with the Stompy decks. You already have like Vivian is seeing a lot of play and being pretty strong and adds like a lot of devotion. You have Shifting Ceratops. You got Questing Beast. Do you think this is gonna beat out like the already busted cards we have in the style of deck that would play it? I mean, Shifting Ceratops is obviously good because the protection for blue and can't be countered. Uh, but like, just I kind of read this as just a four mana. Like, I'm okay with it just being a four mana enchantment where I get to just try to draw a card, right? Or or like, kind of just surveil or whatever. Like, it's like cool. All right. Next up, we have Dahlia of the Endless Dance, red and a green, two two legendary creature, Seder, haste. Other satyrs you control get plus one plus one and have haste. Whenever you attack with three or more creatures, you may discard a card at random. If you do, draw two cards. I... Is this the best lord of all time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is a good lord, but you it's can't like... stack them. They're legendary, though. And it's for satyrs, which yeah. is among the worst tribes of all time. So they deserve Maybe... a good lord. <laughs> Maybe we get the red, the one mana red satyr, the one that deals damage to you equal to Ooh, the damage. fire drinker. Oh, yeah. yeah. We just start Free seeing print. a bunch of satyrs this set, and then it, it, I mean, yeah. <laughs> sure. I mean, we had like Xenagos making legit two ones or whatever. Like, we've had a lot of satyrs in the past just due to planeswalkers. And this is a two mana two two with haste. And then even if you don't have satyrs, it's just three or more creatures. You get a desperate ravings. Is that? Actually, it's the opposite, right? It's like a it's 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 a rummage <laughs> but you you get to draw a card right you do you have three or more creatures attacking uh yeah one of I these mean, is gallia the problem is if yeah. you can't discard a card you can't draw a card yeah you <laughs> can't draw do the, the hellbent trick yeah that yeah. doesn't that doesn't actually work with this i think that gallia is i think it has potential to be good i'm just not sure like last time we were in theros we got like uh uh, centaur lords and whatnot and they just like never did anything because the tribe is so bad so i'm a little skeptical of like satyrs as a tribe but it doesn't read like a bad card maybe you just have like a couple of other satyrs in your deck incidentally whatever good ones happen to show up and then i mean a 2-2 haste that can maybe draw you cards that doesn't seem like a bad creature in like some sort of gruel aggro deck yeah is is it better than like the goblin, the two mana two two riot goblin. <laughs> probably. I mean, the legendary thing is a bit of a drawback, though. Like, yeah. I think I would probably want to play a couple of these over the goblin, but I don't know if I'd play a whole playset. All right. Next up, we have Underworld Breach, one and a red enchantment. Each non-land card in your graveyard has escape. The escape cost is equal to the card's mana cost, plus exile three other cards from your graveyard. At the beginning of the end step, sacrifice Underworld Breach. I feel like there has to be a way this is broken. I don't know what it is yet, but I feel like it exists. <laughs> I'm trying to think, are there cards that, like, incidentally mill you that are now playable? Uh, like Rituals or something like that? Like, the problem is, okay, so two mana passing Flames, obviously super broken, but you need to have a stocked graveyard. So you need cards that fill your graveyard to actually take advantage of this? Yeah. Ugh. So I think if you can get a stock graveyard, this should be able to win you the game somehow. Like you can just like keep casting. One of the unique parts is unlike Past in Flames and like uh Yagwill, this puts a card back in the graveyard. You don't have to exile it when it goes back into the graveyard. So you can like repeatedly cast the same ritual, repeatedly cast the same whatever. The challenge is how do you actually like make sure you have 20 extra cards or something in your graveyard to be able to cast enough spells in the same turn? Is it possible? I, I bet someone will break this somewhere. I, 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 I mean, even if you go back to Legacy, there's decks that just dump your entire graveyard on, like, turn two or turn one. Like, so there's got to be ways that someone will be, figure out how to break this. Yeah, I think I think this this looks like Hogak to me. <laughs> this is, like, surely this, like, mana cost is not relevant, right? Like, we've shown time and time again the the cost of exiling cards from graveyard is not that relevant. And I'm sure there'll be some version with like thought scours and metamorphoses and rituals or something that like will let you storm off quite easily. Someone just needs to figure it out. But I suspect this will be broken. What do you think about standard and specific? Is this a card that is mostly for older formats or do you think there's a chance this is a 
a standard playable card. We've been talking about like Temet, Calls the Dead, uh, the Green Saga. <laughs> Those are cards that fill your graveyard. Is there any merit to like, I play this, I cast like two cards from my graveyard and I drew two for two mana or whatever. Like, is there any merit to playing it somewhat fairly in standard? No. I, I, don't, <laughs> fairly? I don't see why what I'm playing in standard with this. Not yet, at least. Um, <sighs> like, I would, I would play, if you try to play it fairly, I would play Binding of the Titans over this and you know how much I like that. <laughs> and you did not like, like yeah. <laughs> like if you want to play this a standard, it has to be it has to be part of a combo, right? Like because you have to pay the cost of the card itself, right? So, you know, what you get back like a five drop or something or two two drops. Like I, I don't know, like does that seem worth it for being a dead card like literally the entirety of the game <laughs> before you get to the end game with all this stocked up. Like it doesn't seem you can you can cast really the lure it. of the unknown oh, again. Ooh. Wait, Thousand Year Storm is still in the format, and it doesn't yeah. save from your hand. <laughs> so you can just cast the same shock over and over again, or whatever. Mm. Mm. I'm going to try to build that. It's probably going to be horrible, but it seems like it'd be fun, at least. I mean, yeah, that's I, that's what we all said about, like, you know, Feel the Dead Scape Shift. It's not going to be great, <laughs> and it'd probably be fun. <laughs> and so I, I may, maybe it maybe it just completely blows the format wide open, and then it's just like, all right. I remember well, there I was is... asking you guys about Cat Oven, and you guys like, no, it's a meme deck. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> and here you know, we are me... today. <laughs> it was a meme deck <laughs> until it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it has potential, but it has. I think it has to be a combo of some some sort. Now, do we have standard combos? I don't know, but. Don't you find it weird that it's an enchantment that just like kind of immediately dies? Like, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's weird. Yeah. I, I guess they could interrupt you in the middle of your chain by disenchanting Underworld Breach. <laughs> yeah, that that is actually true. That's a that's a good point. Like, it has to be on the battlefield. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I I expect it'll be broken somewhere. Most likely in older formats. Safest bet is probably it doesn't see a lot of standard play, but then uh, I guess the other <laughs> possibility is it just does something super broken and it's like dominating the metagame. All right, last card. Thirst for meaning, two and a blue, instant. Draw three cards, then discard two cards unless you discard an enchantment card. Uh, I think this it, will be played. Yeah, like it will be played depending on like the the enchantment part like i mean is uh, it's There's like, gotta be what, some like, random saga that's like yeah. playable and then people will just play this for thirst for knowledge effect. for enchantments is yeah. like a-okay with me right i, I mean once uh, I, I guess now you have more of a reason to play esper stacks like before you know the blue was just what teferi dance of the mance now maybe you have this it's a little sketchy that like Teferi shuts down the instant speed aspect and Narset shuts down the, the draw card <laughs> aspect, so that that part's a little awkward, but I mean, obviously Thirst for Knowledge is really powerful. I don't think this is quite Thirst for Knowledge powerful, just because enchantments are not as broken as artifacts traditionally. There's not, like, enchantment lands or a ton of, like, really cheap enchantments, so I think it is a little safer compared to Thirst of Knowledge, which was incredibly powerful back in the day. Uh, but I still think it's a very good card draw spell. Also worth noting that it's common, so it has pauper implications potentially, if you can uh, maybe make that work. So I, I was kind of surprised. It feels like something that would be uncommon to me more than common, honestly. All right. Uh, last up. So those are all the new cards, but we'll drop this before we go. Reprinted, Grey Merchant of Asphodel, and the Temples. So Temple of Abandoned, Deceit, Enlightened, Malice, and Plenty reprinted that was in the set. Pretty pretty easy prediction. <laughs> After we already got half of them and they're already associated with arrows. I was surprised by Grey Merchant coming back, honestly. I wasn't sure that they would give us what was probably the best devotion card outside of Nykthos last time around, but I'm definitely excited for it, especially since we still have Bolas' Citadel in the format, and Bolas' Citadel Grey Merchant is just, oh man, it's so sweet, so well, we'll see. Do you think Do you think that Mono Black Devotion Lord. will be anywhere near as good as it was last time around, where it was the best deck in Thero Standard for basically the entire year, most of the year? I mean, I, I'm thinking, like, we have Ayara, um... The three ma the three drop or whatever like yeah uh, I mean depends on like what like I don't know maybe maybe whatever the god does in black like I don't know I mean it, Gary's good Gary's a very good magical card I love the new artwork 
Um, but you know, Gary into like the 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 Nico Bolas Citadel. That's I don't know. That doesn't seem that strong to me. I mean, like it seems all right. I guess. Believe but... grip. No, you had to do it the other way though. You want to play the Citadel <laughs> and then cast yeah. Gary off of the Citadel. Yeah. I mean, yes. Like if you do it off the Citadel, that's pretty cool because uh, you can keep going. But I don't know. It, it like Mono Black was definitely way more aggressive. And it was way more disruptive before. Like we had thought seas, all this other stuff. We so, we have we have Piper yeah. the Swarm to be our pack rat. <laughs> okay, have, there it is. The, we have the, the crux to be our the thought crux seas. of that deck was not Gary. Gary was like the sweet finisher, but yeah. it was thought seas, pack rat, beauty vault, underworld connections. Yeah, underworld um, connections was huge. But it was basically just pack rat, right? Like if you didn't yeah. deal with it there, you were dead. And if you dealt with it. There were still all these other cards coming down the pipe, and then there's a thought seize just to make sure you didn't deal with it. So and life bane zombie was like just efficient. Like you get yeah. to exile a green or white card and then <laughs> But that that doesn't mean this devotion deck can't be good. I, I feel yeah. Gary, I feel someone's gonna make, and then we have like all these powerful black cards that cost life uh in standard today. So I think Gary will offset that. So I think we will have some kind of black devotion deck, but I don't think it's the same style as the old one, unless they give us a thought seize and a two mana play. That's really yeah, it's, strong. It's really hard to judge like this early in spoiler season, like the devotion colors, because we just don't really know what support they get from the set. They'll probably get a decent amount since it's one of the main mechanics. But I think with devotion and even escape to some extent, it's kind of like wait and see until we see more of the set to really judge what's going to be good and what's going to be powerful. Anyway. All right. I think, uh, does that bring us to the end of our spoilers for today, then? That is the end of our spoilers. Well, we are only on official day one of spoiler season, so we'll have a ton more to talk about next week, but we got a couple minutes, so let's finish wrapping up 2019. We had a couple more topics. Uh, Last week, we talked about kind of the formats in a broad sense, but we want to get a little bit more specific with uh, card of the year and also set of the year. So uh, what do you guys think? What was the magical card... Uh, to uh to steal a grim phrase uh of of uh of 2019 in your opinion i think i think our like do we have to like the card or or is you it don't, just... you don't have to like it yeah you can justify it however you see fit because I, I i think the the most 2019 card is easily oko it did I, I did the most memes that's for sure i mean like 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 watching a black lotus get elked and then punch for lethal. I think that that is that's that's very 2019 of, of magic. That is a that is a good pick. It is it is hard to argue against Oko being like maybe the defining card of the year. I think I might go with uh, I might go with Hogak actually. Like, uh, I definitely agree with the Oko aspect, but I think if I was going to pick just the most broken card of the year, I actually think that Hogak was more broken than Oko was. We didn't obviously experience it in standard, so the impact was a little bit less. It only impacted older formats, but it's still showing up in Legacy. It led to maybe the most broken deck in the history of modern. Like, I think we forget a little bit, like, how insane Hogak was, especially before it started getting targeted by bannings. Like, we had never really experienced anything like that in the modern format, going back to, like, the earliest days. It was just so strong and so fast. We had people playing, like, main deck Leyline of the Voids, and it still wasn't always enough to uh, to actually fight against the Hogak menace. So I think I'm going to pick, uh, pick Hogak as my card of the year. Yeah, I think I agree with Seth. I think, so Oko is like, for meme value, is up there, right? Like, just all the elk memes and just being everywhere. But to me, Hogak killed Modern. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, Modern, like, the reason Pioneer took off was, I think, because of Hogak. Because Hogak just left this taste in everyone's mouth that there's like, ah, oh, remember... Oko, uh, Hogak survived, uh, had, had to be banned twice. Remember, like, Bridge from Below got the axe originally, and then they're like, turns out it's not relevant, and, uh, our deck is even better now. And to dominate a format as old as modern for so long, uh, is, uh, or that, that was being played for so long is crazy. And I, I, I think it actually killed modern. I think that was a tipping point where people are like, 
screw modern. I don't want to die in turn three, four, and whatever garbage you have now, right? Like we're going to jump ship to Pioneer where things are slower and more nice, right? So I, I do think Hogak, you know, took out the kneecap of modern or something. <laughs> like modern <laughs> is not as, as glorious as it used to be. And I, I blame Hogak. So his domination and yeah, just don't, don't print eight mana tramplers <laughs> that are free. <laughs> Yeah, that yeah, that is. I mean, you know what it, answers Hogak though, right? <laughs> Oko. Oko. <laughs> yeah, Oko. <laughs> but but what what if you have Hogak backed up by Veil of Summer? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I hate that card. And plus, you probably just card. you'd probably just get milled out before you ever got to activate Oko, at least with the <laughs> original builds of the Hogak deck. So <laughs> that's a that's card of the year. What about set of the year? This year we had Ravnica Allegiance. We had War of the Spark. We had Modern Horizons, we had M20, we had Throne of Eldraine. I think those were the main sets of the year, at least, discounting supplementals. Did any of those stand out above the rest as uh, the set of the year, the most impactful, whatever criteria you want to lend to Wait, it? You, you skipped out on Commander 2019, Modern yeah. Horizons. I, I said Modern Horizons. I did say, oh, yeah, that's did? true. Commander 2019 is a good one to add to the list. I think it's hard to know where to draw the line when it comes to supplementals, like Secret Lair. Does that get added into, like, does that count as a set? Ooh. I'm not 100% uh, sure. Even even if we did count all of that, I think my favorite set so far is still War of the Spark. Because I had to ferry. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, like, like it, it does look a little bad that yes, Teferi is in the set, but, but I think War of the Spark was just like the most fun. Uh, like I just had a blast playing that standard, and I mean, I like Planeswalkers, so why not have play with like thirty six of them, right? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I enjoyed that standard quite a bit, even if it like when you think about it, that set is what almost completely destroyed control magic, right? Like you couldn't like do like land go play style. But even with that, I still thought it was so cool. Like, passives on Planeswalkers were fun for me, even if I played into them. <laughs> like, you know I what still, I mean? Like, I, it's been a year almost, and I still play into them, like, one out of every, like, ten times or something. I still just put <laughs> yeah. into those brutally. <laughs> like, like I still, like, you know, you still see people cracking Fabled Passage into an Ashiok, right? So, like, like I don't know. I, I It was... It was a neat time because it was the first time I guess we got to see passives on a planeswalker, which made it uh, even better. Um, but yeah, the, the set was a blast for me. What do you think, Richard? Uh, I'm not sure. The toss up for me is Modern Horizons or War of the Spark. I really enjoyed War of the Spark. I think they did the planeswalkers beautifully. Remember, we're like, what, what, what's an uncommon planeswalker? What does that even look like? Right? What are planeswalker passives? Uh, but now I think. You know, after playing with them for so long, like they were brilliant. They were really good. Uh, however, Modern Horizons shook up like literally every other format. Uh, it was the first time we got a direct to modern printing that we all asked for. And then I realized you should never listen to me because I do not <laughs> want that anymore now that I've seen <laughs> the results of it. Uh, so to me, it, it's like a breaking point in magic, right? Like we see like these formats that didn't really change over a long period of time suddenly all get changed with Modern Horizons as Wizards pushed new powerful cards. You know, I would have never expected another free spell like Ella Pact of Negation. <laughs> of course, our favorite Red and Six, Hogak, all those cards in Modern Horizons. So I think Modern Horizons had a bigger impact in like how we think about magic and the future of magic in all formats. But War of the Spark was the most fun set like just seeing all the planeswalkers, uh, the Japanese alternate art planeswalkers, uh, the passives, all of that. So toss up between the two. I I will not help break the tie and say that <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the modern horizons camp. I think yes, there were some negative impacts from the set. Yes, there were some broken cards. I don't know how fair it is to single out Modern Horizons for that, though. Like, yes, Hogak broke things, Ren and Six broke things, but so did, like, Oko and Once Upon a Time from a standard set, or Veil of Summer and Field of the Dead from a standard set. So I don't think it's super fair to single out Modern Horizons on power level concerns. And if you really dig into it and see what the set did to Modern, if you're willing to look past some of those really pushed cards that had negative impacts. Hogak, uh, arguably Urza, 
maybe Renin 6, although I guess that's more in Legacy. There are so many decks that are a thing in Modern now because of Modern Horizons, like Goblins. That wasn't really a thing, but we got uh, Goblin Matron, for example, in Modern Horizons. There's random, like, Snow Control decks. There's Yogmoth decks. There's Soul Herder decks. There's a massive list of decks that... Uh, Five-Color niv Mizzet wouldn't exist without Astrolabe. There's a huge list of decks that are fine in the format, are fun and unique and cool in the format that would not exist if it wasn't for Modern Horizons. And the ability to put cards into Modern without going through Standard, because a lot of those cards, honestly, they aren't going to put in Standard for whatever reason. They're just too good or too whatever. So I'm going to pick Modern Horizons as my set of the year, despite some of the negative consequences, despite the fact that I've mostly played Pioneer now and haven't played as much Modern, maybe, as Richard argued, as a result of Hogak and Modern Horizons. But <laughs> still, I I'm glad that Wizards took the chance uh, and tried the direct to modern uh, format for a set. And I think if you look past the few really egregious mistakes, it actually had a pretty positive impact on the format. I mean, yeah, like I, I'm not, I'm not even going to take into account like, like it, like modern horizons is definitely a cool set. And yes, there were broken cards like you, you had said, but that's not something I'm going to mark against it. But even then war of the spark just had, a lot of fun cards, so I don't know. I, I I'm on board with War of the Spark. It had the trailer too. Yeah, and it just Modern had Horizons. Ugh, everything <laughs> about it was right. Ooh. From the trailer to like like yes, even the Mimi trailer <laughs> song. But like I I I I just thought everything for War of the Spark was just well thought out. That's that's actually a good question. Uh, 2019 War of the Spark trailer or Throne of Eldraine trailer? Theros War of the Beyond Spark. Death doesn't doesn't get included. We were gonna forget that one already. I mean, I, I did, somebody did a thing for the Theros trailer, and and it's, when the little girl turns around, it's just Teferi. <laughs> and, it, it's like, I, uh, and it was just one of his lines from uh, from the arena, like "I'm always on time" or <laughs> or "Let's slow things down." <laughs> and then as and then the the scene where it's like Elspeth's face of distraught and horror behind her is Oko just like staring at her. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I like Throne of Eldraine better, I think. I think they were both, like, very strong. And yeah, I don't think there's really a wrong choice here. But I really like kind of, like, the playful nature of the of the Throne of Eldraine trailer. So, I don't know. What do you think, Richard? Break the tie. I like Eldraine. I think Eldraine was really unique and on point for Eldraine. And it really sold me into the world of Eldraine. Whereas War of the Spark was good, but it's just, like generic fantasy good you, you'd expect that anywhere right but where would you see like gingerbread like you know running around getting destroyed and then trying to kill like garrick like i think <laughs> that really set the scene for aldrain and really set kind of the, the story for me up so i really liked the the aldrain one oh, all right any other final 2019 uh thoughts before we move on and answer some fish mail today yeah all right uh yeah richard fish mail us all right. If you have questions, send them to at MTGGoldfish with the hashtag MGFishmail, and we'll get to your questions on air. MF Partridge. How is creating a non-rotating format every seven to eight years different slash better than having one format that rotates every seven to eight years? Seems like Pioneer has essentially rotated Modern out. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far. I don't think Modern has rotated out. We might be heading in that direction over the next few years, but there's still definitely plenty of modern tournaments in support right now. So I think that's the main difference, that just because Pioneer is a thing doesn't mean that modern's not a thing. When if you had an actual rotation, it would essentially mean that. All of a sudden, you couldn't play any of those cards that you were you were playing before. <laughs> Uh, I haven't played modern in, 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 a, in a bit, so I'm kind of in the yeah. Maybe, maybe Pioneer rotated modern for me, but I mean, I think it it rotates in the sense that some players never played again. But there will there is a group of modern players, just like how Legacy like rotated out Vintage and Modern rotated out Legacy. Like it's still a distinct format, and like Seth said, if you actually rotate it, it's gone. But here you can still play it, right? But there will always be a more popular format, and that will probably be the newer one. Also, fixing the timeline is weird. Uh, like It's just we've hit critical mass, and magic cards are different enough now that they can split it. But if you said it had to happen in eight years, 
like is that better than nine years seven years like i don't know so it's, i think it's better to just make a judgment call like at the right time as to when you, you want to split it uh refresh demon what do you think about adding weight classes to format where weight classes are determined by budget twenty dollars fifty dollars hundred dollars two hundred fifty dollars you weigh in on a certain date before the tournament checking your deck list against a designated site and go hmm so I guess that would actually be basically splitting tournaments into a bunch of smaller tournaments where people match up based on budget. I think that's, like, I like the idea of budget tournaments, although you have lots of problems with that as well, where if a deck does really good and the format's popular, it's no longer budget, and then it, it really complicates things. It would make it hard to actually keep a legal deck for some of those formats, the lower budget formats. I think the other concern is, do you just split people up too much? Like, if you go to your local game store and you have 20 people to play modern, and you have, you know, five people that have fully tiered expensive decks and then a few people with like $200 decks and then a couple people like are you going to end up with just a bunch of like three player tournaments at all these different weight classes so while I like the idea in theory I'm not sure how well it would actually work in practice yeah it's tough I I, I don't know like wizards would never do this because they don't want to acknowledge the prices the equivalent on arena would be like limiting your number of like mythics or rares but I feel like the game is not balanced around these costs. So like if you say, let's play $100 budget, there might be one deck that's just simply way better than every other deck. And then therefore it's not fun. Uh, so not, I'm not sure how, how you could address this. I think it's definitely a fun option for playgroups, though. I would definitely, like, if you want to, like, have everyone in your playgroup build a $25 deck and do your own, like, game night or tournament, I think that's a really fun idea. All right. Uh, Thy Salmon. What would you like to see in multiplayer magic in 2020? I would love a Curses Commander that when dealt damage, you would put Curses on the battlefield attached to the player that dealt damage to you. Ooh. That would be... That would be pretty spicy. Hmm. Hmm. More, more stacks cards, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, more panharmonicons, of course. <laughs> that's actually that's actually a really tough question. I haven't really thought about what I want for multiplayer. I think what I don't want is more like arcane signet, four staple type cards, which I'm a little nervous about. With more products coming up, that it would be easy to trend that direction. Uh, so I guess like natural more natural growth and staples that that don't feel like they're shoehorned into being staples for the format yeah I, i'm kind of on board with that too uh just no like auto includes and whatnot but i mean because like it's kind of I, I don't like the idea that when you go into deck building and like you go all right cool well 100 cards but like 32 of them are already just predetermined like these are auto includes so just not a fan of those kind of cards either yeah, I want to see more political cards. I want, like, enchantments that everyone can interact with. Like, I'm thinking of, like, an enchantment where, let's say, like, whenever you deal combat damage to a player, you get a token. And then you can, like, trade in those tokens to do something. And everyone can activate this ability. Mm. Like, I feel like those kind of cards where so if someone puts it down and then the game suddenly changes because now you're playing this weird sub game of like everyone can interact with this thing so i, I feel like stuff like that i like that idea monarchy is like one of my favorite mechanics and that kind of has that effect on the game so i would love more mechanics like that. i think another one that everyone's been talking about and i agree with is like somehow fixing white or improving white so it's <laughs> It's more of an actual playable color rather than just, like, something you sometimes have to put in your deck because your commander has it as one of its colors. Yeah. Uh, one Epic Pug. Eternal format staples seem to be declining. Jace the Mind Sculptor. Fetches, Duel, Snaptasters, Lily of the Veil all seem to be down 15 to 20% since Eldraine came out. And it's accelerating. Why is this happening? And is now a good time to buy? Uh, so, I don't think Alderaan actually has anything to do with it. I think that the other thing that happened at the same time as Alderaan, roughly, was the announcement of Pioneer. So, what I'm pretty sure is happening with, uh, especially modern staples, is Pioneer was announced, some number of modern players fell in love with Pioneer, 
sold off a lot of their modern staples that were not legal in Pioneer, the Jaces and Fetchlands, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and use that money to buy into the Pioneer format. So uh, that caused the modern prices to go down. And at the same time, we saw like huge price spikes in cars that were playable in Pioneer. If you look at uh, another example, this would be uh, something like Thoughtseize, which Thoughtseize is a modern staple. It's one of the most played cards in the format that doubled in price in the same time frame. So I think that that that's exactly what's happening. Whether or not it's time to buy in now, that is tough. I, I still am not sure what the long-term future of Modern holds. I know there's support for this year with Grand Prix and SCG events and other stuff. Will there be support in two or three years? Is it better to just like invest in Pioneer than Modern? I haven't really figured that out yet, but that's the current process that we're going through is some number of players like selling off their Modern cards and buying into Pioneer. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I've touched my, like, you know, my, like any of those cards in a while. So I, I kind of, I, I'd probably move some of that if I were to sell cards, but also me, I just would never sell cards. <laughs> and I, I'm not really sure what, why that is either. Like why those cards have like had a, had a decline. Maybe people are just dumping them because they are buying into Pioneer. Who knows? Yeah, I think like some players have like limited, limited uh, budget when it comes to magic. So if you want to get into Pioneer and you don't have, you know, a bunch of uh, extra money around to buy a few Pioneer decks, one of the easiest ways to do that is be like, oh, I got this modern deck that I probably won't use very much anymore that's worth a thousand dollars. Like, I could get three Pioneer decks for that or whatever, and uh, they just sell the deck and, and buy their Pioneer deck. So I think that's something that at least some players have done. All right. Last question. Brian Sharp was with the decline in paper standard and the shift to arena do you see wizards trying to recoup loss money by increasing the monetization in arena in 2020 also does arena negate sponsored players ability to acquire slash share decks is it possible to increase actually increase the monetization of arena more than it already is (laughs) that would be my my first question i mean i'm sure wizards will find a way and yes i think they will keep monetizing (laughs) arena as much as possible we've seen that be a trend since arena launched with like random dragons appearing in the store and this and that so i'm sure they're going to try to monetize it i don't know if the borrowing decks and cards things is as much of a concern just because the cost of arena is cheaper for those players. Like if you're someone who's a streamer or a pro, it's not that cost prohibitive to actually just own all of standard on arenas. You can spend 150 bucks a set or something and basically have everything you need. So I'm not sure if that's actually a huge concern compared to like paper where a single deck could be $800 and you might need to switch it every week to, you know, stay fresh in the meta. Uh, But I do think we'll keep seeing more and more innovative ways of monetizing arena. Yeah. I hope they increase the monetization through innovation and not just increasing the prices. Like, hey, we changed the vault again or, you know, whatever, right? Uh, or 2X wildcards for historic. Like, I, I feel they're not doing a good job with their skins and, um, what do you call them? Like card backs, play mats and things like that. Like, I, I just, I'm not a fan of the parallel, the parallax effect. Like, Sure, it's fine in a card or two, but like I have no incentive whatsoever to bling up my deck. But if they made custom art or like custom version, like think like various skins in various games like League of Legends, where they put a ton of time and effort in making an alternate version of a character, uh, I, I would pay for that. Like the Japanese planeswalkers, things like that. Uh, but they seem to keep tying it to paper, which limits their ability to do this. So they need like an alternate art that's only available on Arena. Like, I I don't know, like Idris Elba's Teferi or something, right? Like, I don't know, like some weird or like, oh, Transformers, like throw it in, My Little Ponies, but (laughs) only for one card done really well so that you can kind of customize and show off, you know, your personality. I I think that would, I would pay money for that. Uh, But They're just doing like, ah, here are some promos and we're putting them on Magic Arena. And then for a limited time, they cost gold and now they cost gems. Like it's very formula-like. So I think they need to put some more creativity in that part. 
Uh, that is all our fish mail this week. Thank you to everyone who sent them in. If you have questions, you can send them to at MTG Goldfish with the hashtag MTG Fish Mail, and we'll get to your questions on air. And I believe that brings us to the end of episode 257 of the MTG Goldfish podcast. So, Richard Krim, thanks for hanging out. Thanks to everyone for listening. Hope for everyone is having a wonderful holiday season. We will be back next week with more Theros Beyond Death spoilers and whatever else happens in the world of magic. So, until then, this is Crew signing out. Thank you.